Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. Welcome to another Online Great Books Podcast. I have Malachi with us again today, Malachi Wall. She was in the uh, episode that we did uh, earlier about him being a uh, an, an ad man and a great books man, and uh, he's also a rhetoric and writing guy, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Flaneur. And you've been working on, for a number of years actually, a writing, an instructional method uh, to help people get some facility with writing that you've built around, uh, well, Aristotle's rhetoric and some other great works. Tell us all about it. People want to know how to write. Okay. Uh, Well, why do you think they want to know how to write? I guess it's because a lot of people don't feel very confident uh, when it comes to writing. And I also think uh, the way a lot of people were taught to write, it was sort of to avoid mistakes. Mm. Uh, I remember I was taught we all had to read the little Bible, you know, the Elements of Style by Strunk and White, and they yeah. were New Yorker writers and journalists, and you know, only girls use the passive voice. You know, if you want a good manly <laughs> is that style, in there? Like Ernest Hemingway. Well, no, but it's implied, I think. Right, right. Uh, strong, sinuous prose. Uh, you avoided a passive voice. You never used an adverb or adjective, and um, you were very careful with your word choice so that you had very kind of clean writing and you wanted to make sure your subjects and verbs agreed and so forth. So you got the feeling that writing was kind of avoiding mistakes, right, to a good end for clarity. In Mm -hmm. other words, what they would constantly point out is, well, if you don't have subjects and verbs agree or if you lay on too many words and nobody can follow what you're saying and you're unclear. So it was all a virtuous enterprise. But nonetheless, I know in me, it created a kind of paranoia where you would sort of ruthlessly proofread and mm-hmm. transpose all passive voices and whatnot. If I could, uh, the best way to explain kind of my approach to writing and teaching writing is to kind of go through the way I learned, which I think it would be clear if, if I could do that. Yeah, tell us. Okay. So I, mean, I had the, the good fortune of... Uh, going to Catholic grammar school and had the nuns. And the nuns told us how to diagram set. You had the nuns, like people have the measles. <laughs> right. Hey, they are the unsung heroes of education. You know, For all the uh, ill news about the priests, you hear very little ill news about those grammar school nuns we grew up with. But we learned, and in fact, uh, uh, Alter has made a, a documentary. It was just out on CBS, and I think it's on HBO now, about... Uh, uh, Jimmy Breslin and Pete Hamill, uh, two of the great kind of journalists of uh, 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 the 1990s, right? Or actually from the 60s through the 90s, kind of credited with inventing new journalism. And he was interviewing them, and they both credited their ability to write uh, to the nuns. Hmm. <laughs> they had gone to Catholic schools in New York, and they learned how to diagram sentences and learn how to write those masculine active voice, subject, verb, object, subject, verb, object, don't make it complicated uh, writing. And they also were journalists. Neither of them went to college. In fact, both of them said the decline in writing can be when the editors and journalists started to go to college. In those days, my mother, by the way, was a journalist. She went from high school to working for the Chicago Sun as a writer. You went right out of high school and you got and you knew people and you interviewed people and you wrote who, what, when, where, how, and why writing. Very workmanlike and trade like. Right. Yeah. And if you think about the people you know who are pretty good writers, a lot of them went to journalism school. Right? In other words, the folks who write pretty well seem to have gone to journalism school where they learned how to write leads and the who, what, when, where, how, and why questions right. and answer them. And they became sort of models of good writing. The same time, they also, I think, promulgate the, well, you know, these guys learned through the school of hard knocks. So to be a good writer, 
You have to write every day. It's really hard. And you have to be kind of a tough guy right. to do it. Or kind of a really smart guy. Hamill was a smart guy. Or Tom Wolfe, who was also, he was, a, he was a Yale guy, right? But who created the new journalism as well. Um, but you had to be a really smart guy so that writers were considered smart. When I grew up, you know, the heroes were Norman Mailer, the big popular writers who made big arguments and kind of had this process. And they were sort of role models that we all wanted. So uh, Chicago, when, uh, where, where do you put Turkle on that? Is he a, he's a tough guy, yeah? Or is he a smart he guy? He is, 1930s, and it was barroom talk, you know. Yep. Uh, he had a thing on Channel 11 here in Chicago the pub called Studs' Place, which was basically a Chicago – tried to recreate Chicago bar talk. Right. Uh, yeah, that's, that's Studs' Turkle. bar talk, not bar talk, the musician. Uh, yeah, he wrote, what, uh, The Good War. Um, there's a, uh, He wrote a, a narrative history about what uh, working life. Working. Working. Uh, right. I wanted to write a, a book in – uh, against it called loafing. Oh yeah. Where I was going to interview people like bridge tenders and right fielders. And- <laughs> right fielders. <laughs> I, uh, uh, I was very influenced by Turkle. Actually, I read that stuff when I was in junior high and I thought that it was just magnificent. His ability to ask those questions and get good answers from people. Well, and a great trainer, uh, great training. If you're going to do blogs, I would think. Yeah. And interviews. Cause he was, a genius at each. So at any rate, I'll continue my story. So I got that through grammar school and diagramming sense up. In high school, the way I was taught to uh, to write was that's where you learned how to write a research paper, right? And index cards. And I thought that was kind of fruity at the time. I thought index <laughs> cards were, you know, those were for the kids who, you know, made sure their ties were clipped on right. They were they'd, too neat. And I didn't, uh, I stupidly did not follow the index card. I would have saved myself a lot of time in becoming a writer had I done that. So then I get to college. I go to Georgetown in D.C. And there, this is the era, I'm in college in the 60s. And the way English was taught, if you had a classical education like I did, was with uh, Brooks and Warren's rhetoric, which gave you role... They thought writing should be taught the way you learn how to draw, which is you sit in a gallery and you imitate. Mm. Either you draw life models or you imitate the great the great painters. And you used to be able in the art institute in Chicago, I'd go through and you'd see people literally sketching, trying to recreate their great masters, learning the forms. They were called the formalist critics. I I mean, the name of Cleanth Brooks's uh, book was The Well-Wrought Urn. (laughs) That gave you an idea of what he thought writing was, was working uh, very strictly in a form. And of course, Robert Penn Warren wrote All the King's Men. He was a professional best-selling author who also sort of believed in this. And the other kind of culture of great writing in America is Southerners. Hmm. The whole Southern movements, the Allen Tates and whatnot. So if you were a Southern male or Southern female, you know, a Flannery or you could write. Nobody knew how, but if you were Southern, you were born with the gift it, it, of writing. That's hard to that's hard to disagree with. You know, I've been reading a lot of Walker Percy lately. Absolutely, and he lived right down the street from Shelby Foot. And uh, you know, it's just it must have been in the well water. They didn't, you know, they didn't have city water. It must have been in the well water. They just speak and write beautifully. It's amazing. A part of the culture, like the Irish. I think for them, it's part of the, you know, I say they speak beautifully, and they did, and then they could, and by extension, then they could write well, write beautifully as well. Yes, indeed. And I think that will go hand in hand with what I'll be talking about. Yeah. So, okay, then, so that ends the formal education. So I had the role model method, and that helped my writing a lot. That was a good method to learn from. So and it was a little more positive than the, the nanny, uh, don't make any mistakes writing. But then I went to graduate school at University of Chicago, and that's where I got exposed to Shakespeare because I was kind of specializing in Shakespeare. And I got interested in how Shakespeare learned how to write, and that led me to this wonderful nun, another nun. So the nuns bookend my (laughs) career. Sister Miriam Joseph, who had gone to Columbia and was a great friend of Mortimer Adler in the great books and wrote on the Trivium also wrote on uh, Shakespeare's use of language and how he learned how to write. And he learned how to write by studying classical rhetoric, the schemes and the tropes and the principles of rhetoric. 
So that got me very, and of course, the University of Chicago was famous for having a rhetorical orientation to both philosophy and literature uh, via uh, Wayne Booth, the rhetoric of fiction, and Richard McKeon and the whole Elder Olson, the whole so-called neo-Aristotelian group that was there at the time. That was my next big aha. Oh, there is this art of putting things together. And that's, as I say, where I learned about schemes and tropes, positive ways. It, It was a skill you could learn. That Shakespeare got to be a better writer the more he practiced his things. You know, Shakespeare, there was no punctuation in Shakespeare times. He learned how to write a sentence by learning sentence patterns. Like you can take Salem out of the country, but you can't take the country out of Salem. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. You like it. It likes you, said 7-Up. That is a scheme in classical rhetoric. Right. And he was sent home and told to write 20 of them. And there are about 30 of these patterns, and he just mastered them all. And every sentence he writes is in one of those patterns. It wasn't that he was told to write a complete sentence or a grammatical sentence. If it wasn't in the pattern of a scheme, mm. it wasn't a sentence <laughs> or an improvisation on a scheme. So that was a big aha. So then I go into advertising right, (laughs) and start out as a writer. But at the same time, there's this new thing going through advertising, which is called account planning, which J. Walter Thompson uh, invented in England, uh, in London in the 1960s with a guy by the name of Stephen King. One of the clients complained, Thompson was one of the first global ad agencies, and they complained, well, you guys don't have a common method for you know, if I talk to your Paris office, they make advertising in one way. London, you do it. New York does it another way. What is the Thompson way? So uh, Thompson said, point well taken. So they sent the Stephen King, not the horror novelist, but a recent Cambridge graduate around the world to go to the office, 200 and some offices of J. Walter Thompson and develop a best practices, which became the Thompson way. The Thompson Way was written as a set of questions and answers you should ask yourself as if you want to develop a communications program for a client. And this became known as the art of account planning. And I went to London to learn how to do this and became one of the first account planners in America. Plus, it fitted my education perfectly. And I was when we went to this account planning, it was just what I loved to do. Then I was assigned... So, well, we got to train people how to do this, one. So I got assigned to work on the group of how to train people around the world how to use these questions and answers. Then over and above that, it occurred to me that is there a way that we could get people to do this together in one day? And I and a couple of other people invented a technique called day one where we put a whole bunch of people together in a room and could come up with an advertising strategy or communication strategy at the end of the day was the idea. Going through a set of very disciplined questions. So how does this all relate to writing? Well, what it came back to is people, clients like Kraft, the big clients would have their planning years. So every account guy, let's say you were the manager of Oscar Mayer Hot Dogs. You had to do a PowerPoint presentation on how you plan to build the hot dog business next year, right? And this was a big time in in, in companies when you had to present your next year's plan. Well, the the senior clients complained. They said, oh, we get 100 slides of gobbledygook. We can't figure out what people are saying. And I think this is where people will say the problem with writing is, is often in business meetings, You'll go in and PowerPoint for you seem to lead nowhere. And there's 8,000 pieces of data on a slide that nobody could possibly interpret. And our clients, when we invited them to attend our day ones, we said, well, let's not just do this ourselves. They love them. And then they started to notice and they said, you know what? Our plans are getting like crystal clear now because they kind of organize their plans against the questions you guys put. And and each slide's a question and answer. And at the end, we know like what they're going to do. Surprise, surprise. And so the irony of the day one is it not only improved 
the planning, the thinking itself, but it also improved the writing. And as I was reflecting on this in my own education and often being invited to help people learn how to write, I used to do a writing course at Thompson, and I taught it at DePaul on and off many years. I, I just began to see, my goodness, these people, the problem most people have with writing is either one of two things. Either it's a dialect issue, uh, which is I don't know how to write proper English. It's still grammatical. People say so it just doesn't find the formal gra grammar. Um, but it's a dialect issue, which doesn't lead you into a common language, but that's learnable because it's like, or it's English as a second language. You know, you're over here from China and you're trying to figure out how to put English sentences and spelling together, which is impossible because <laughs> <laughs> our spelling's nuts. There are no, no rules that make any sense. Um, but those are kind of fixable. Most people, I think when they have a problem with writing, it's because they really don't know what they want to say. Mm -hmm. You can tell when somebody has something to say, they usually write it out pretty well. When they don't really know what they think themselves or ask to write something artificial, then they don't really know what to write. And that leads them to write poorly or long sentences or to rely on let's move the envelope or, you know, uh, the cliches were, that we're all told by the nanny is um, not to use. So long story short, therefore, out of all this, out of the Thompson way, especially, I then kind of connected it back. And I realized, my goodness, what the Thompson way or the day one that I took credit for inventing was, was basically applying Aristotle's principles and Cicero's mm -hmm. principles from classical rhetoric. In other words, if you think like an advertising man and ask yourself what you're doing, what do you come out with? You come out with the, the, the basic truths of writing effectively. And so that's kind of where I came out and what led to the development of this course. So therefore, I don't do a lot of things in the course that what you would expect in a writing course. Number one, we don't do any writing. Yeah, so I, I should clarify that you have created a course. Like you said, you've taught it to J. Walter Thompson many times. you taught right. it to DePaul a little bit. And you're getting ready to actually run it for some of our members at Online Great Books. And you're in the works with, of uh, compiling the, this course into a book. Uh, yes. So, so hopefully that'll be coming out here maybe maybe late this year. That would be great. Let me put some pressure on you. When is that coming out? <laughs> <laughs> late this year. Yeah, late, late, late 2019. Uh, and you know, it, I I think it's just amazing. Well, it's not amazing. We we knew that this would happen, but I love that you're able to draw a straight line from reading great books, liberal arts education, to a practical application. With you know, and it's not just that you wrote for advertising purposes. You you you're really writing to get other people to understand something that was important, and we all have that problem. <laughs> We, we all have that problem. You're advertising for yourself so that you can get a raise. Um, you're trying to write a coherent email to someone so they can understand what you need them to do or whatever. We all have the advertising problem, the rhetoric problem. Right. Well, if, if my first version of this, I used to call it a jobs. When I would offer courses, some clients would often ask me to come in and offer, you know, a two day seminar in writing. And to make it simple, I, I called it a jobs approach to writing, which is what job are you trying to accomplish with this writing? So don't start with any worries about rules mm. for writing. Ask yourself, what is this writing supposed to do? Right. Right. Write that down and then figure out what needs to happen for the writing to do that and then go ahead and do that. Yes, I've seen the outline for your course, and and like you said earlier, before I interrupted you, you don't do any writing. You're really teaching people how to ask the questions they need to ask of themselves, so they'll know what the heck it is they need to write. Well, and that's why I'm kind of titling it this time, so how to become a Socratic scribbler. Yeah, which is that uh, one of the first things that you'll read in uh, the great books is often Plato, and Socrates is the the master of right asking questions. And if you think about writing, 
all kinds of writing is really posing and answering questions. Now, that makes perfect sense when you think of any kind of expository writing. You might hesitate and say, oh, wait a minute. A play doesn't ask and answer questions or now. Well, yes, it does. If the first chapter of a novel or the first scene of a play doesn't say, gee, is he really going to do that? Is right. Caesar really going to die? Uh, or how will they do that? You're not interested in reading further. In fact, the art of writing or capturing somebody's attention is is putting a question in somebody's mind. And once you recognize that's the role of like the first scene, it makes that first scene a whole lot easier to write. Um, so I think that all kinds of writing, therefore, is about questions and answers. And this leads me to develop what I call the three kinds of writing that people do or the three basic jobs. One job or the big one is conveying knowledge or information. Now, if you think about it, this also relates to sort of Mortimer Adler's basic question. What do they say? Right. <laughs> right. You know, um, how do you put a battery in a flashlight? Uh, how do I get from here to there? Um, what happened yesterday at work? You're asking people for explanations. Uh, what had happened at yesterday's meeting? Uh, what are we going to do next year? All these questions of who, what, how, and why are related to information that needs answering. And there are particular ways that have been developed for conveying information. And this gets into the stuff that Aristotle talked about. What are the questions that are being asked when you're conveying information? And that is typically who, what, when, where, how, and why. You're answering those kinds of questions. And as Aristotle points out, you can kind of proceed in a consistent way. You can start with particulars. What can you do with a particular? You can describe it, right? You can compare it and contrast to another particular. And then you start to create groups based upon similarities and differences, categories, which leads you to logical connections, and then you can put them in temporal or spatial sequences. That's really all you can do. There really are only five or six ways you can explain something. And I, I got very, well, why didn't anybody ever tell me that? You know, it would have made excellent. And if I had that checklist in front of me, boom, I know when I explain something, I could make sure, well, what should I put this in some sort of spatial order or, you know, step one, step three, or should I put it in five categories, my three aha moments or something like that? Think how people like listicles, mm -hmm. right? Well, we all like listicles because that's the format we expect when we get things explained to us, I think. Now, sometimes things require more than an explanation, which is, well, how do you know that? You know, kind of, I need some proof. And that's where, again, you get into the organon and science, which is, well, what do we take as evidence? And that's where you get into, do I use witnesses? Do I use case histories? Do I use examples? What's my, if somebody really needs, if I ask directions, I don't usually ask the guy to prove to me that he's given me the right directions, right? But other things, I, if you want me to send somebody to jail, I kind of would like some evidence before I vote on that. I, 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 again, I have to point it out because you're, you're so sneaky. It, you know, you're talking about Aristotle's rhetoric and how, you, how you've applied that, but then you say, okay, so I'm answering these big questions, who, what, when, where, why, all that. Uh, and then you said, but then we have to find out, you know, we have to have some sort of standard of proof. And then you, and then you dropped Aristotle again in the Organon because he, he describes to us how we know things in that book. Right. And so you use the knowledge he told, he taught us about how we know things to then become a better writer. Right. And that's how to learn how to write explanations in the rhetoric. You do not learn how to write an explanation. No. The rhetoric's concerned with persuasion, which I'll talk about in a minute, the, the second kind of writing. But if you think about it, all this kind of writing is about knowledge. You're conveying knowledge. The next kind of writing, which the rhetoric particularly addresses and the ethics, by the way, is when sometimes I'm not just explaining things, but I'm asked to explain the value of things. Um, you might say, well, who would you recommend to be a host, mm -hmm. right? That implies we have some ideal host in mind or some criteria that would make a good discussion leader. And what would those criteria be? 
And we have a conversation about values and goodness, right? These are questions about what's the right or good thing to do. And that's where you get into persuasion. How do I end up doing something good or what I want? It's also about our desires. Because again, as we know from Aristotle and the ethics and from Plato, choices and actions, the world of practical life is this Roman. So we're going beyond knowledge and now into practical decisions about life. What is good? So we're beyond knowledge here, just knowledge, but it's a build on it. It assumes that you know how to do that stuff. But the next two things you need to learn how to do if you're going to persuade people is you've got to be an expert in people's desires. And there's a hierarchy of them from the physical desires to intellectual desires to the desires of the soul. And again, in advertising planning, this is what we spent all our time on. You know, um, you know, is this a chocolate bar or is it sex? <laughs> if we have to explain that, we're in trouble. Right. But truthfully, it's sex for women as a rule. I mean, physiologically. It is a sensual experience to eat a good chocolate bar. Yes, a good chocolate bar. Right. is. And that's why you find those ridiculously humorous ads around Christmas about women just m- melting more than the chocolate. You know. So let me, let, me, let me ask you about this. This is something that bugs me, but, and I think that only you can satisfy me with this. <laughs> uh, I, I love to listen to old-time radio shows. Uh, I listen to you know Johnny Dollar and these Gunsmoke, these old radio shows, and and, and you can get them on podcasts now, and uh, and they've got the original advertising. And in the fifties and and before, advertising was very very concrete. Buy our product because it's economical, it's effective, it'll do the job you want it to do. Uh, benefit, benefit, benefit. The end. And and now it's now the advertising is more. Like what you're talking about, like you're what you're talking about in the chocolate bar, or uh, drink this beer, you'll be more attractive. Wear these shoes, and you'll be a you know. It's more about the person than it is the product, right? Or about image. Um, you you rarely watch a commercial. You rarely see advertising now where they talk about the benefits of the product. Me being the rational person I am, I want to hear about the benefits. <laughs> But, but no, that that's fair enough. And you know, if you're buying a vacuum cleaner, I I think you want to hear about the specific benefits and functionality. The way the hierarchy of benefits usually goes is it starts out with the physical attributes or service attributes of a thing or a person or an organization. And then you work yourself, well, what are the sensory experiences like? Okay. And then from the sensory to the functional, does this help me do something quicker, faster, more convenient, economical? Does it help save me money or make me rich? Down to the to the social, then the political, does this give me more power at work? Uh, to uh, or romance and then up through spiritual manifestation. And that's Aristotle's hierarchy of good, or is stolen by Abraham Maslow. Maslow's mm-hmm. hierarchy. So, um, so but your, people have generally agreed on what they are. So earlier, you gave an example of Seven Up. You said uh, Seven Up likes you. you. You like Seven Up, and Seven Up likes you, or what was it? Right. You like it. It likes you. There you go. I mean, so that's the spiritual thing, I, isn't yes. it? Well, it is. I think it. That was the original Seven Up. Seven Up has had two great campaigns. You like it, it likes you, and the Uncola. The Uncola. Right? Actually, right. Thompson did the Uncola a little before I got there. My mentor did the Uncola campaign. He's the guy who taught me how to do this. His name is John Furr. Um, yes, using higher order bread. Well, you like it, it likes you. People who like lemon lime drinks as opposed to cola, cola became kind of the big American drink. You know, buy the, I'd like to buy the world a Coke mm. kind of thing. Um, seven up was always a little more eccentric drink, right? It's a people or just seven up were always a little different. So it doesn't say everybody likes it. See, Coca-Cola is telling you we're everybody's drink, right? Seven up say, no, you're particular. You like it. We like you back. (laughs) We have a personal relationship. So as dumb as that line may seem, think of the big idea behind that. Right, mm-hmm. it's beautiful rhetoric. Really, I mean, it's astounding. And what beautiful rhetoric! And in the part of rhetoric that I'm talking about here, 
in classical rhetoric, you'd learn like it was Cicero would outline, well, how do you begin to write something? You start with the first part of the process is invention, which is you decide what's going to, what you're going to say to achieve your objective with your audience. The next part is once you've decided all those, you arrange those things in the order that will work best for your reader or audience. Then you choose style, that is words and sentences that fit what you're saying and will help make the next thing memorable. And then finally, you talked about speech, it was delivery. The part of rhetoric that's never taught is invention, mm -hmm. which it, and that's basically what day one is. How did those guys come up with the idea? You know, it's seven ups a peculiar kind of drink. And if you think about it, the Uncola campaign was basically a rewrite or an updating mm -hmm. of the You Like It, It Likes You campaign. It's basically saying, hey, this is for people who don't want to go with the flow. Now, higher order benefits is always a trick. One of the other classic case studies is, do you remember, in, you may not, there was an era in which pantyhose were very popular. Right. And a popular brand was called Legs. And they were trying, Legs was trying to figure out, well, should we sell the functional benefits? That is, you know, fit or smoothness or whatever. And they worked their way up the ladder and they said, oh, or do we say, you know what, ladies, wear these hoes and you'll get married or you'll get laid, you know, whatever right. your preference, but we'll move you all the way up that ladder of romance as right. far as you want to go. Okay. So, um, and then the question got to be, well, where do we? Where should we message? Should we message way up there? And to your to your point, Scott, when this is Mr. said, so, well, all kinds of things are involved in getting people married. Nobody's really going to believe that. At the same time, the primary reason people wear these hose is well, they'll buy certain hose for functionality, but that's not why are they wearing the hose in the first place? And they came down to Men will notice your legs if you wear these hose. And that's where they came up is you'll get noticed if you were. So what they did is you take the benefit as high as where it makes the critical difference in people's choices. Hmm. Yeah, you could have made the argument, like you said, uh, wear these. They came in an egg. It was just the silliest thing ever. And, um, uh, you wear but these. What's more and feminine than an egg? <laughs> Right, right. Uh, was that part of the discussion, the egg packaging, in fact? Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, that's great. That's amazing. I wasn't there, but I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, so we get to see behind the curtain here. It's so fascinating. And so, so this, uh, hey, you'll get married. They're like, mm, that's a little absurd. So they backed it off a bit to you'll to get where noticed. It's that's credible, fascinating. Because you want to be credible. It does it. But this again, and this, remember, this is my second type of writing, which is if you're in the business of persuading or recommending something, and we used to I'd call them passion points and pain points. They're a positive side, or I can scare you to death, you know. <laughs> Smoke cigarettes and you'll die. <laughs> right. That's fair rhetoric as well, because it's true. Um, so that's the second kind. And we, and we discuss... What are the tools for that? Well, you do have to understand the hierarchy of benefits and what makes them credible. And that's what we talk about then. When you're trying to, and you've got to persuade, you have to know what your reader or audience thinks. What questions do they need to answer? So the, the way I would write a creative brief was, what do people currently think, feel, and do? What do I want them to think, feel, and do? And what will get them from A to B? What will it? What questions do I need to answer to make them believe that Seven Up will get them from A to B? So conspiracies really do exist. You conspire day in and day out to alter people's behavior <laughs> so they would buy pantyhose in a little egg. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Free yeah. market of ideas. Yeah, and, and, and again, I have to. This this seems obvious, but I think we need to say it again here before we go into writing style number three, writing purpose number three, is that. Uh, this isn't about advertising for, to sell products. This is about um, getting a job, um, writing a paper for your teacher. This is about um, making a new pitch to your boss to take on a new area of responsibility. This is about asking your girlfriend to marry you. Yeah. Yeah. All those things. 
It is big time. Which kind of gets us into our third thing. So we what we what have we got so far? We got knowledge, and we've got action and making. So there's writing and thinking involved with conveying knowledge, and there's writing and thinking in conveying advice about action. What's then the next kind? And Aristotle refers to this as well. He calls it ceremonial rhetoric. Mm. And if you really, and he also calls it poetry in the poetics. What he's talking about here is, okay, and the other kinds of writing, it's either very kind of theoretical, right, knowledge, or it's practical, like advice. But there's a whole other kind of writing, which is, or talking, where I want, there's the coach building up the team at halftime. There's the toast I gave my daughter at her wedding. There's the funeral oration I gave at the death of my best friend, which I actually had to write one of those at one time. There's the poem, I want to write my girlfriend. What are we, what are those kind of, the thank you note, I want to write somebody for dinner. Um, These kinds of things, we really want to, it's beyond persuasion. It's we want to really connect with them in a personal way. It's Mm -hmm. almost like an act of friendship or love or hate, because I may also want to curse you. I'm so angry. And we find lots of these speeches of the Iliad, by the way, of both mm-hmm. kinds, <laughs> which is I'm really, I have a, I want to kill you or I want to love you, right? These are the <laughs> two things about a basic human relationships. Is there some rub between a continuum of love and hate? This is love hate talk. And it can mm-hmm. be friendship, it can be, I want, you to send this guy to the electric chair at the end of the day. That closing summation uh, that a lawyer gives. So what kinds of questions are you addressing here? If we had knowledge, when here we're addressing questions of drama, right? Conflict of people with conflicting agendas and how are those agendas reconciled? So they're either alliances, but if you think about it, where Aristotle deals with these is the poetics. We tell stories to move people. The people who move people best are the storytellers or the poet makers or the songwriters. They're the ones that get people to cry. Right? When you tell people a song, you get so engaged. So we're tapping into everything that we tapped into in persuasion. We're tapping into facts and whatnot as well. But we're now building it into telling a story, and it can be an internal conflict. It can be a funny story, right? Uh, you mm-hmm. know, 10 reasons I'm glad to unload my daughter on you, father speech. Right. <laughs> now you'll have to deal with her tantrums. Now you'll have to. So you could do all kinds of comedy, tragedy, satire. But writing at this stage is really. You're basically creating internal and external conflicts, which you then reconcile in some way for an emotional effect. You know, think of a great coach inspiring the team. He'll get very personal. He'll call on each player and either praise him or blame him for his behavior. And this is where you get into the myths, using the myths. Am I telling a redemption story? Uh, Am I telling a revenge story? Am I telling a get even story? So here's where the genres or kinds of story or a lyric poem or a song is about how this visit uh, to this lake made me remember all the romances of my life or something. And this is where you get into where we consider the real writers live, the people, the great storytellers. And then so how do you write these things? Well, then you have to know how to write a story, basically. Yeah, comic yeah. or tragic. And that's basically positing people internally or external with conflicting agendas and have them work out. This is probably where you have to have the most introspection as well, I would think. You'd have to be aware of uh, what these stories uh, do to you uh, emotionally in order to be able to write them the most effectively. 
And you do, and think a writer has to make, you know, Adler says in How to Read a Book, you have to say, what kind of book is this, right? And they say, was this an adventure? Is it a romance? Is it an epic? If you think about the writer has to sort of make the same kind of decision. Like, well, what kind of story is this? And then there are, back to the Brooks and Warren thing, there are great role models for, you know, so there are no new stories. You have to decide... Does your experience fit a classic, it's finding the right model to use kind of conflict, and then you can kind of innovate on that yeah. or Pe- improvise? People toss off the line, oh, that old trope? Yep, they all are. Um, but can you make it personal? Can you make it, can you make it fit this purpose? And can you use that trope to a good end is the, really the only question. It's all- so the better part of the course is what we'll do is discuss each of these three kinds And this all comes under invention, which Mm -hmm. is the big part. How do you decide what you want to say? And notice that this gets really interesting. You don't have to do it alone. It's great to co-author. And in fact, I I, I could show things. If you look at the way Hollywood writers write or the Netflix writers today, there is a big wall with a million index cards. Working out the plot step by miserable step with the themes that they want. All of Aristotle's sections of the poetics are written up. I have uh, photos on slides, which I hope if I could figure out how to show in the course on the, on the Zoom thing, which I think we can. People can actually see how professional writers today work and kind of always did work, which is they have little pieces Remember, the big problem I think a lot of us have with outlining, my response to outlining is, well, how do I know what I'm going to say until I say it? But if you work this way with questions and answers, you write questions and answers on index cards or slips of paper. Then you go through Cicero's second part. You arrange them in the order for your your reader. So this is where I talk about the, the the literal physical tools you use if you want to write well is you should write on little slips of paper. Some people still use the big sheets if you want to. It's just mm. hard big. to shuffle. I create director James Patterson uses those giant legal pads. Um, so I can't <laughs> criticize that method. He sells a zillion books every year. And we'll discuss how to use those and how to put things together. And then the last part of the course deals with how do you put sentences together? And I introduce schemes and tropes. i to tell you a story. When I was at uh, in J. Walter Thompson, we were putting together day one. The Cray said, well, have, do you have any tips for like writing sentences? And I said, well, yeah. Do you guys know about the schemes and tropes? And they didn't because none of them. They did them naturally because they wrote slogans and headlines, right? Right. Well, you would have thought I brought down the Ten Capan. So I felt like Charlton Heston. <laughs> I just sent an email with a list of the schemes and tropes. Of and, and one guy, God, all I've got to do is take my idea and experiment with each of these things, and one of them will see. And yep. that's yes, that's really all you have to do is take your idea, experiment through a few of the schemes or tra- tropes are metaphors or comparisons. Again, we usually learn in school what a simile, a metaphor, and an analogy. Right. Shakespeare learned some 30 or 40, metonymy, you know, all hands on deck. There are all kinds of different kinds of comparisons you can make. And if you start to master those, they get very good in helping you write zinger sentences. So it leads you to write a sentence. Thank you. You have to write a thank you note. Okay. Thank you very much for the wonderful dinner. Okay. But if it opens with something like just a short note with a big thank you, that balance, oh, you know, it could... (laughs) Right, the, the contrast of the short and the big in that opening line right. makes and, it seem and, better. And then you say, you know, the deliciousness of of the stew was only surpassed by the scrumptiousness of the gossip right. <laughs> about so-and-so. Well, that thank you note really connects with people. Um, and if you spend time on thank you notes, your career is settled for life because nobody writes them anymore or knows how to write them. I have an example, which I won't give here, but there's Marilyn Monroe wrote one of the greatest thank you notes ever to a hotel guy, which I use as an example. She was actually a very good writer, Marilyn. So uh, we discuss schemes and tropes, and there's a book about them, which I kind of ask people to get. 
only because then that becomes a resource for you forever that you can uh, start to make sure that you write. I talk about writing headlines, not titles. And headlines guide people in stories. Titles will guide the topics, but a headline says something about it. You know, that I could write three aha moments or I could write the three aha moments that turn me into a conservative. Right. One's an idea, the other's a title. People like the idea. That's what's appealing. So yeah. that's basically the scope of the course. And and if you're an online great books member, you just get to go and uh, benefit from all of your experience and the you know your organizational skills are just astounding. You've been able to uh, see all these sort of abstract ideas, make them concrete, organize them, and you know draw a, a path through them all so that it's a teachable method. Uh, it's a uh, it's it's pretty fantastic. It's a, it's a, it's a delight to watch it really is. Well, thank you. But I, I think I learned it most in the advertising business developing that day one, because you know, the old line is it's one thing to, to do something. A lot of people who write can't teach you how to write because in a way they've, they've kind of developed these habits by instinct. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why a lot of reporters are good writers because they wrote on deadline you know, they just had to write something and they knew the questions they had to answer and they just went ahead and did it. And then they put their own personalities into it. And that's also what I hope comes out of this is basically I give you a method where you can write anything and you come up with a little checklist and say, OK, if you're writing about, you know, an evaluation issue or a promise issue, you know, here are the kinds of promises you could use. What ones if you can't think of one, you go, oh, you know what this one is. Suddenly it they become stimulation for invention for you to decide what you think. So you end up, I don't want people to think, well, this classical rhetoric is well, you just copy something somebody did before. Not at all. It's a checklist of stuff to think about. You know, uh, Benjamin Franklin in his autobiography talks about, uh, he would take news stories um, when he was a youngster, probably like a 14, 15 year old. And he would take news stories uh, from the newspaper and then he would rewrite them. And then he would compare, did I miss any points? Did I convey it better than the other? And, uh, and I, that's the way he, that he learned those, uh, all those forms and tropes. You know? And then he ended up being, he ended up being able to, uh, I mean, he ended up being uh, poor Richard, right? Just write these beautiful little aphorisms that we know so many of by heart. You know, a penny saved is a penny earned. A stitch in time saves nine. Like all those things. Which we call enthemes today. Right. Yep. Which is taking your main little bit of logic and turning it into a shorthand, memorable headline. And that's what all those so-called aphorisms are. You know, how do Oscar Wilde writer, George Bernard Shaw? Mm -hmm. Basically the same way. You know how Malcolm X learned how to write? When he was in prison, he went to the prison library and he copied out a book of the great speeches. And he was a great speech. Giver. Other advantage African Americans have as writers, and why Martin Luther King is such a great writer, is Baptist preachers were still taught via classical rhetoric. Right. That's why Jesse Jackson and King, Jackson almost takes the schemes and tropes to a self parody. There's so much rhyming and balance, you know, it, it's almost you want to make fun of it. Nonetheless, he has a you know he has a gift for it. He'll he'll take the idea and make it rhyme. And damn if you don't remember, you know. Right. And but King could do this on a grand scope. The I have a dream speech uses the metaphor. I went to the mountaintop. You know the grandest rhetoric of ever. And that's African American Baptist ministry has taught great writing better probably than anybody yeah, but, other yeah. school, ironically. Yes, letter from Birmingham jail sticks and uh, yeah, just yeah, fan, yeah, fantastic writing. Well, man, thank you for outlining this for everyone, and uh, and I I can't wait to see this this book that's coming from this. Uh, and well, I, the other thing I'm hoping for is I hope what the book will be, or the way I'm imagining it, will be a report on this course. Hmm. That is, I'm going to use our dis it's I designed this course as a discussion. So we're all going to talk about and bring our own experiences like, you know, how did you learn how to write? You know, who was your great mentor or what was your big breakthrough? And I think as we share those experiences, I hope my this is a framework from which everybody in the room can present their positive gifts for writing and for thinking 
kind of like what is writing is kind of sharing thinking, isn't it? Yeah, of course. Yes. Yeah, the ri- writing is the method whereby we make another know the, co- the contents of our mind. I think so. I think so too. You know, that's what it is when it's best. You talk about you know, who are the influences. Um, uh, I write, I write, you know, a lot of stuff that goes out to our members online, great books. And I, uh, Jared, uh, Markle, who does all of, uh, like our email, mo- mo- um, automations. I says, man, you, you know, your, your emails just, they set, they read like you sound and they're funny. And, uh, and so when you said, you know, who are the influences, it made me think, well, who are mine? And it instantly I was like, oh man, Joseph Heller and Catch-22. Just uh, tight, absurd sentences. Uh, and uh, uh, it was a, just a big influence on me, uh, which, is <laughs> kind of, which is interesting. And Turkle, actually. Uh, I love the way the guy writes. Uh, the, the, the sort of real tight, um, a real the tight American, funny writing. Uh, Twain. So it's your favorite books? Probably, yeah. Yeah, Catch-22 was my favorite book for years and years and years. It is, it is no longer because um, um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what that guy's driving at there. I don't know. I don't know that that is a virtuous book. Um, but, uh, but, but I loved it. I loved it for a time, for sure. I think, uh, as Aristotle says in the rhetoric, your life stage strongly affects your response to what you're hearing. Yeah. You know, he says, you know, if you're trying to appeal to a group of young men, young men have very different interests than old men. Yeah, I, I loved at that time when I was a, a early high school kid, you know, I loved the anti-authoritarianism and the absurdity of Catch-22, I love 1984, Animal Farm, uh, all those sort of dystopian, um, um, Brave New World, all those sort of things, Clockwork Orange. I left all, <laughs> all that sort of stuff at that time, and I don't really read that so much anymore. So what do you read now? Well, the great books keep you busy. They, they do. They do. Uh, I, I, I just love these books dealing with these, uh, these, big, these big problems that, that bother me. What is justice? You know, how do we behave properly? How do we best interact with the people around us? The, those problems. You know, how, if we were to understand the universe, how would we know we understood it? Like those kinds of things are the things that are most interesting to me now. And, and so those are the things that I'm, uh, I'm drawn to reading about more and more. I'm also interested. I'm also interested in pedagogy. You know, how do people, how do we, how do, how are, how are people taught and how do they learn? And, uh, I've spent, you know, cause I've got, I've got kids and, uh, of course this project I'm in and the, in the barbell coaching, I'm very interested in teaching people stuff. So I spend a lot of time on that. So this would be a good example mm-hmm. that, that like, when you're teaching the barbell stuff, mm-hmm. instruction, especially if you're lifting heavy weights, mm-hmm. proper form has to be critical. So that's not like a discussion topic, no. is it? You well, kind of have to tell people how to do something and point out things that they should watch for. It's kind of like the avoid mistakes because you could hurt yourself side of it. it in terms I'm of wondering the, how you, how you handle that. So if it's, it's a challenge, logic is, is that like teaching writing in some ways? Cause it is a skill. It, it, it is the coach. If you're teaching, if, if you're coaching someone who's squatting a very, very heavy weight, they have something very heavy on their back and what's heavy for one person may not be heavy for another. It doesn't matter if they're near their limits. For me, my butt is the- that. That might be your limit, and when you're when you're near your limits, you're cognitively impaired. So we have to be able to give you cues that are very short. They're easy for you to digest. That make get you to move properly. I, when you're squatting and you're on your toes, and you need to reach back with your bottom, and your brain's a little fuzzy because it's heavy. Uh, it's very difficult. It can be very difficult to describe what you want them to do. So you might yell at the guy heels reach back, you know, you see, you have to get very, very short. You have to have these very, very short cues that can get Almost the message. Almost military-like. Through. Yes. And oftentimes when the squat session is over, we'll have to sit down and say, hey, um, this is what was happening. So when I yell heels, you should feel this. So you have to give them a kind of a, a decoder ring <laughs> for the cues. So when they hear that cue next time and it's short and quick, they know what to do. And there's almost like a Pavlovian thing. When I do this, you do that. A, b- a behavioralism kind of a thing that has to happen. Stimulus response. Yes. 
I have a friend who has a business which is called the Brief Lab, and he teaches people how to be brief. And his biggest client are the special forces. Oh, I bet. Because mm. if they don't say what they mean in three words, people get killed. Right. <laughs> you know? And the problem was that the, the military, of course, tends towards a liking for jargon as opposed to yes, that jargon leads right, to snafus left, up to, up two feet you know yeah. well we need to have him on here and talk about that that's fascinating oh you should that yeah. would be great actually. yeah hook us up we'll I'll, do that I'll, I'll write him and let him know he would love that well that's been an, about an hour with malachi i tell you i could talk to you endlessly i mean it's just fascinating to me and uh, i love your delivery and uh, thanks so much for doing all of that no well, thank you for giving me the old man's opportunity to spout off there's nothing ah. old bed like <laughs> <laughs> when, when advice is all you have left to give. <laughs> well, you, you have good advice. Uh, you have good advice, and I'm glad to take it. Uh, well, so watch, watch for Maliki's book. We'll uh, we'll announce when that thing comes out. And uh, and if you join onlinegreatbooks.com, you get to you get to benefit from this guy. He leads seminars with us or for us, and uh, uh, he has led many a uh, discussion on his note taking methods. With which is those discussions are fantastic. Um, I've taken them to heart. In fact, Maliki, here's my here are my uh, here's my index card filing box right there. Yeah, and here are my cards here next to my open copy of Plato, um, and uh, and then you'll also get to you know sit in a reading uh, this reading course and discussion group, this Socratic scribblings group that we're gonna, that he's getting ready to kick off. It's so exciting! Thank you, man. It is. I can't wait. So uh, please come and join me, and we'll do as many as people want to show up for. I hope. Yeah. Well, there's another online great books podcast. I hope you guys enjoy it. Email us if you'd like with any more comments or questions or uh, topic suggestions. You can email us at podcast at onlinegreatbooks.com. And if you want to uh, be part of this, uh, we're, enrollment is probably closed right now. We only open for seven days every eight weeks or so. Uh, you can go to the website onlinegreatbooks.com and go to the top right-hand corner and click join now and join the VIP waiting list. That way you'll get a uh, first shot at joining when we do open. And uh, thanks for listening. <laughs>